X-Men the Animated Series is back and with a brand new coat of paint. Now called X-Men 97, the series continues the story of the X-Men after the events of X-Men the Animated Series, complete with its 90s aesthetic. So it's about time we cover this show with 107 facts about X-Men 97. If you haven't already, check out part one on our sister channel, Channel Frederator, where we cover conceptualization, development, and talk about some of the cool things found in the first episode of the show. In this part, we're continuing that and covering some things we found in episodes one through four of X-Men 97. Let's get started. Number 55. All right, let's start with some cool things we saw in episode one. Don't know how many of you were alive in the 90s, but since this series is still set in the late 90s, it's only accurate that the New York skyline still has the Twin Towers. Number 56. WHIH is featured as a news outlet, which is the same news outlet that we see in multiple MCU projects. You'll notice that this network is featured in future episodes as well. 57. In episode one, there's a blink and you'll miss it moment, showing off the front page of a Daily Bugle issue flying through the air. One of the headlines states, is Spider Spider-Man a mutant, solidifying that Spider-Man does still exist in this universe just like the original series. Number 58. Alongside that headline, there's also a story about the Hellfire Gala written by Eddie Brock with photos taken by Peter Parker. 59. Featured on a bookshelf in Beast's lab is a book authored by Jay Lewald, referencing Julia Lewald, who is a writer for X-Men the Animated Series. Number 60. The portrait that Cyclops looks at features the original X-Men himself, Jean, Beast, Angel, and Iceman. They're even wearing their original comic uniforms, even down to Iceman wearing his boots. Number 61, we get to see Professor Xavier's death certificate, and we now know that he supposedly died on November 11, 1996. Number 62, during the fight against the Sentinels in Episode 1, Beast takes over a Sentinel and utters the line, this is the start of a beautiful involuntary friendship, which is a reference and remix of the line from the end of the film Casablanca. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Number 63. Throughout episode 1, we see Morph transform into Professor X, Jean Grey, and Angel. Number 64. Ending the episode 1 section, let's talk parallels. There are a lot of parallels between episode 1 of 97 and episode 1 of the original series. For one, Roberto, the new mutant in this episode, fills in Jubilee's shoes. He is the mutant that the X-Men have to rescue from antagonistic forces. We even get a Sentinel story to match. Number 65. When Roberto is rescued, he even wakes up to see Beast in his lab later in the episode, similar to how Jubilee first met Beast. Number 65. Speaking of Beast, he has a copy of Animal Farm on his shelf, the same book he was reading in jail in the original series. Number 67. Roberto meets Wolverine in the Danger Room just as Wolverine was introduced in the original series. Number 68. Moving on to Episode 2. Episode 2's intro sequence changes slightly now with Magneto taking the first spot and Professor X being removed. Number 69. Magneto's character card takes place on Asteroid M, which is a space station created by Magneto himself. Number 70. Magneto's new costume, showing off his shoulders along with the giant M on his his chest originates from his design in Uncanny X-Men number 200. Number 71. In Jean's room, we see a shot of the photo that Wolverine was caressing in the famous meme. I just know that they did this on purpose. I just know. Like, not only is it a callback, it is definitely because everyone memed the hell out of it. Number 72. When Jean pulls out a green and yellow suit, it's actually her Marvel Girl suit from back in the day. Number 73. The shot of Magneto cuffed in a courtroom is an homage to the cover of the Uncanny X-Men number 200. Number 74. Wolverine's car from the pilot episode makes an appearance here as the car he uses to drive Jean to the hospital. Number 75. On the way to the hospital, we see several storefronts named after X-Men alums, such as Wine's Cafe and Diner named after writer Len Wine and Romita's Salon, named after John Romita Jr., who drew the cover for Uncanny X-Men number 200. Number 76. The events of the comic being adapted into X-Men 97 don't stop there, as the birth of Nathan Summers happens in Uncanny X-Men number 201, which follows Magneto assuming the role that Professor X left him with. Like comics, like show. The Morlocks that we see in this episode are Callisto, Leech, Ape, Erg, and Tommy, which was later in the episode. Number 78. Let's talk about Morph's transformations in Episode 2. In Episode 2, Morph transforms into Lady Deathstrike, Colossus, Psylocke, and Sabretooth. Number 79. How could I forget the end credits? The end credits is an updated version of the original's end credits, featuring a select screen and 3D models. Obviously, this one looks a lot better because technology has advanced, so the 3D models aren't as jank. Number 80. In the opening sequence for episode 3, a new scene featuring Roberto running into a chain link fence has been added, which mirrors Jubilee doing the same thing in the X-Men the Animated Series opening sequence. This adds to the parallels between Roberto and Jubilee and helps solidify Roberto's role for X-Men 97. Number 81. When Madeline parses through Jean Grey's memories, we see several memories redrawn from the original series, except now with a faceless Jean Grey. We see memories from Season 1 Episode 5, Season 3 Episode 17, Season 1 Episode 8, another from Season 1 Episode 5, Season 3 Episode 16, Season 3 Episode 4, or 
14 because they use the same animation, and Season 2, Episode 1. Number 82. The wedding photo featured in this episode is similar to the one drawn for the cover of X-Men Volume 2, Number 30, which was for Scott and Jean's wedding. Number 83. Moore's transformations for Episode 3 include Spiral, Magic, as well as Dark Child, Magic's more demonic form. Number 84. When Madeline and Jean confront each other, Madeline creates a showcase of photos from their past. Amongst them, we see a photo of Cyclops carrying Jean, which is from the cover of the Uncanny X-Men number 136. Number 85. Another one of these photos includes a group shot of the X-Men, which is a recreation of the cover from classic X-Men number 1. Number 86. One of the last photos we see is a little nod to a screen printed poster created by Michael Cho, which was made for X-Men Children of the Atom. Number 87. At the end of the episode, Storm enters a bar called Tequila Mockingbird, which is an obvious nod to the book To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Number 88. Episode 4 of X-Men 97 is split into two different stories, Motendo and Life Death Part 1. The original series never did anything like this, but the format is pretty common among Saturday morning cartoons. Number 89. One of the lines Beast says early in the episode is, the youngest member deserves some jubilation on her 18th birthday. This has several meanings. Jubilation refers to her full name, but also the word jubilee means a special celebration, and it's her birthday. Of course, Beast has to be beasting with his vocabulary and wordplay. Of course, that's his character. Number 90. In Jubilee's room, you can spot a long shot plush sitting on a shelf. Number 91. The Motendo video game console is a clear parody of the Nintendo name, the Sega Genesis console shape, and even features a cartridge that looks like the Genesis cartridge of the X-Men 1993 video game. Number 92. When Jubilee and Roberto are transported into Mojo World, you might notice that the dial-up sound effect plays, which makes sense for its time since the 90s definitely didn't have fiber optic internet widely available. Number 93. The payphone in this episode acting as a means of escape for Jubilee and Roberto is a nod to how payphones were used to extract people out of the Matrix, which is from the film series of the same name. Number 94. While in Mojo World, the Genosha Guard sports a similar color scheme to that of Boba Fett from Star Wars. Number 95. Mojo makes his appearance, and you might notice that his voice is different this time around. That's because he's now voiced by David Arago Jr., replacing Peter Wildman. Arago Jr. has a lot of roles under his belt, but is probably best known for his role as Ferb from Phineas and Ferb. Number 96. Mojo's footage of Wolverine is a recreation of a scene from the Mojo Vision episode from Season 2 of X-Men the Animated Series. Number 97. The line that Mojo says, if you die in the game, you die in real life, is similar to lines uttered in the film Stay Alive, which is, if you die in the game, you die for real, or SAO, if, you, if I die in the game, I'll die in real life, both of which are connected to video games. Number 98. The shows Who's the Boss, A Different World, and Divorce Court, which Mojo uses to showcase his casting of the older X-Men, are actual shows that used to air in the 80s and 90s. 99. Mojo's game that Jubilee and Roberto are playing is called the X-Men Rise of Jubilee. You can see small details that would be featured in a start screen, just like all games nowadays, such as the Motendo copyright, which says it's from 1997, which is when the series takes place. Number 100. Rise of Jubilee features a select screen for potential characters. Jubilee and Roberto are obviously the selected characters, but other characters on the select screen include Colossus, Magic, Gambit, and Cable. Number 101. One little easter egg in the video game includes this wanted post which references the famous cover from the Uncanny X-Men number 141, which covers the Days of Future Past storyline. Number 102. The game itself is a huge homage to the classic X-Men side-scrolling beat-em-up that was developed by Konami in the 90s. Number 103. Stages featured in the game, which are a recreation of some of Jubilee's biggest moments, include Stage 1, Dystopian Street, which is a downtown area which is similar to the first episode from X-Men the Animated Series. Stage 2, Savage Land, which is a jungle, a setting that was featured in Season 2 of X-Men the Animated Series, and final stage, Asteroid M, which is Magneto Space Base. Space Base. Number 104. The arcade cabinet towards the end of the episode is a remixed version of a real X-Men arcade cabinet with some details differing from the real version. Number 105. Speaking of arcade cabinets, to accompany the launch of X-Men 97, Arcade 1-Up created an X-Men 97 arcade cabinet packed with eight Marvel games, which are X-Men vs. Street Fighter, Marvel Super Heroes War of the Gems, Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, X-Men Mutant Apocalypse, Marvel vs. Capcom 2, X-Men Children of the Atom, Marvel vs. Capcom Classic of superheroes and Marvel superheroes. Number 106. Moving on to the life death portion of the episode, we shift from Jubilee and Roberto to Storm and Forge. When in Forge's workshop, there's a photo in the background that features Forge along with his team, the X Factor. Number 107. Let's end it with one small detail. On this corkboard of photos is one featuring a very young Forge and what looks like Dr. Gottfried Adler, who is the one that's credited with the creation of the inhibitor collars used in the show. And that's that. Obviously, by the time this video 
videos out, there'll probably be more episodes of X-Men 97 out, and way more facts about the show. Heck, depending on when this comes out, season 1 might even be done. With that being said, if you want to see more facts about X-Men 97, let us know in the comments below. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that bell to be notified when we upload next. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoy.